In the 1950s and 60s, inventor Dennis Gabor discovered that when you photograph objects with a split light beam and store the information as wave interference patterns, you get a better image than with ordinary point-to-point -point intensity photographs. Not only is the captured image clearer, but it is completely three-dimensional. Lynn McTaggart wrote, In a classic laser hologram, a laser beam is split. One portion is reflected off an object, a china teacup, say. The other is reflected by several mirrors. They are then reunited and captured on a piece of photographic film. The result on the plate, which represents the interference pattern of these waves, resembles nothing more than a set of squiggles or concentric circles. However, when you shine a light beam from the same kind of laser through the film, what you see is a fully realized, incredibly detailed, three-dimensional, virtual image of the china teacup floating in space. An example of this is the image of Princess Leia, which gets generated by R2-D2 in the first movie of the Star Wars series. Michael Talbot wrote, A hologram is produced when a single laser light is split into two separate beams. The first beam is bounced off the object to be photographed. Then the second beam is allowed to collide with the reflected light of the first. When this happens, they create an interference pattern, which is then recorded on a piece of film. As soon as another laser beam is shined through the film, a three-dimensional image of the original object reappears. The three-dimensionality of such images is often eerily convincing. You can actually walk around a holographic projection and view it from different angles as you would a real object. However, if you reach out and try to touch it, your hand will waft right through it, and you will discover there is really nothing there. The three-dimensionality of holographic images is not their only amazing attribute. In holograms, all parts are reflected in the whole, and the whole is reflected in all parts. So if you chop a piece of holographic film into tiny bits, then shine a laser onto any of them, no matter how small, you will still get a complete image. Greg Braden wrote, Back in the 1980s, a series of bookmarks appeared on the market using holographic technology. Each one was made of a shiny strip of silver paper that looked like glossy aluminum foil at first glance. When the paper was held directly under a bright light and tilted back and forth, however, suddenly the images in the foil looked as though they'd come to life and were hovering in the air just above the paper itself. If you have one of these bookmarks, you can do an experiment to demonstrate for yourself just how a hologram works. Use a sharp pair of scissors to cut your beautiful shiny bookmark into hundreds of pieces of any shape. Then take the smallest of the fragments and cut it again into an even tinier piece. If the bookmark is truly a hologram, you'll be able to look at your tiny speck of a bookmark under a magnifying glass and still see the entire image, only on a smaller scale. The reason why is that it exists everywhere throughout the bookmark. The physical world around us behaves much like a hologram. Just like a piece of holographic film, all quanta exist as interfering wave patterns. In and of themselves, these interference waves have no solidity, no definite properties or location, just like the squiggles or circles on holographic film. The image is distributed throughout the entire film, just as quanta are distributed throughout the entire universe. Then, when a laser beam the light of consciousness, is directed at those interference waves, seemingly solid particles, three-dimensional images, appear before our eyes. One of the first physicists to consider this cosmic hologram metaphor was David Bohm, who defined the universe as an undivided wholeness in flowing motion, which he termed the hollow movement. Dean Radin wrote, Einstein's protege, American physicist David Bohm felt that quantum theory suggested the existence of a deeper reality than the one presented by our senses. He dubbed the implicate order an undivided holistic realm that is beyond concepts like space-time, matter, or energy. In the implicate order, everything is fully enfolded or entangled with everything else. By contrast, the explicate order, world of ordinary observations and common sense emerge, or unfold, out of the implicate order. 
Bohm used a hologram as a metaphor to illustrate how information about a whole system can be enfolded into an implicit structure, any part of which reflects the whole. Bohm's implicate order is analogous to the two-dimensional piece of holographic film, and the explicate order is analogous to the three-dimensional holographic image. The implicate order is the underlying undivided wholeness of the universe and the explicate order is the multitude of seemingly separate forms. To illustrate this duality, consider the following passages from my book Asbestos Head. If you blur your vision enough, forms disappear and you are left with nothing but a mass of color in motion. There is no word that describes the blur, but perhaps you make one up. Then you make a habit of making up words for blurs and start recognizing similarities. You label tree blurs, rock blurs, other animal blurs, and maybe even atom blurs. This allows you to compare and categorize, make judgments and express artistic concerns about the blurs, but the fact remains that the boundaries between blurs are perceptual, not actual. We know no two trees, rocks, animals, or atoms are exactly alike, but if no two things are exactly alike, we have no way to measure what constitutes one thing or its other. If no two things are exactly alike, then there must be only one true form that is everything, i.e. the universal hologram. We know that subatomic particles are constantly in motion, but on a smaller scale than we can perceive. We know the universe is perpetually changing and in motion, but we perceive most things as unchanging and still. Then we use language to label this fallacious stillness. We recognize similarities in the stillness and create categories and definitions. We forget all about our faulty premise and attribute a priori importance to these forms we perceive, though in fact knowing no two things are truly separate and everything is constantly moving, a.k.a. the hollow movement. Michael Talbot wrote, Bohm cautions that this does not mean the universe is a giant, undifferentiated mass. Things can be part of an undivided whole and still possess their own unique qualities. To illustrate what he means, he points to the little eddies and whirlpools that often form in a river. At a glance, such eddies appear to be separate things and possess many individual characteristics such as size, rate, and direction of rotation, etc., but careful scrutiny reveals that it is impossible to determine where any given whirlpool ends and the river begins. Thus, Bohm is not suggesting that the differences between things is meaningless. He merely wants us to be aware constantly that dividing various aspects of the hollow movement into things is always an abstraction, a way of making those aspects stand out in our perception by our way of thinking. In attempts to correct this, instead of calling different aspects of the hollow movement things, he prefers to call them relatively independent subtotalities. For Bohm, atoms are not the building blocks of matter, but rather just a term given to one aspect of the hollow movement. The various forms we name, words and categories we create, are all ultimately arbitrary because at the implicate level of reality, everything is one. No two atoms, two rocks, two trees, or two people are any more separate from one another than whirlpools are separate from the river. The universe is a holographic oneness in perpetual motion, both created and navigated by consciousness. Matter is not separated by space and time. Rather, matter, space, and time are always, already, ever-present and one. To illustrate this, think of a DVD. At the explicate level of the DVD, you see a movie with people, places, and events happening in space and time. For the actors on your television screen, they experienced everything happening in real time, in the real world, during filming. But for you, the viewer, holding the DVD in your hand, you can see the implicate level of the movie, where all the people, places, and events on it are mere projections of a single totality. You can rewind, fast-forward, slow-mo, or freeze-frame the entire realistic three-dimensional explicate world of the DVD because you are operating from the implicate world of remote control. The One, God, Infinite Consciousness, 
cosmic mind, or whatever you want to call it, operates at the objective, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent level of the implicate DVD. And meanwhile, us humans, animals, plants, insects, and every other subjective entity in the physical universe are method actors in the explicate movie. Bohm himself said, It will be ultimately misleading, and indeed wrong, to suppose, for example, that each human being is an independent actuality who interacts with other human beings and with nature. Rather, all these are projections of a single totality. Greg Braden wrote, While it may look as though we are disconnected from one another and the rest of the world, that detachment doesn't exist on the plane where the hologram originates. On this level of unity, there really can be no such things as here and there. Michael Talbot wrote, Matter does not exist independently from so-called empty space. It is a part of space. Space is not empty. It is full, a plenum, as opposed to a vacuum, and is the ground for the existence of everything, including ourselves. Adrian Cooper wrote, David Bohm's work into quantum physics and quantum mechanics also realized and affirmed a single ultimate reality, the true nature of the universe. Time will inevitably show the universal explicate, implicate, and super-implicate orders of David Bohm and the hollow movement will eventually have most profound implications for humanity, which all science will quite simply have to accept sooner or later, thus proving conclusively the universe, rather than being a vast and disparate multitude of separately interacting particles of matter, is in reality a magnificent, unbroken completeness, a continuum, an infinite flowing movement of energy, vibration, the hollow movement. Independently of David Bohm's research, Stanford neuroscientist Carl Prebrum proposed a holographic model for explaining the structure and function of the human brain. His work strongly suggests that the brain stores information not locally in so-called engrams, but holographically throughout its entirety. Greg Braden wrote, Interestingly, while Prebrum and David Bohm began their work independently, both were using the same explanations to describe the results of their experiments. They were each applying the holographic model to make sense of life. Bohm, as a quantum physicist, was looking at the universe as a hologram. Prebrum, as a neuroscientist, was studying the brain as a holographic processor. When the two theories are combined, what results is nothing less than a paradigm-shattering possibility. Individual memories were long thought to exist locally in specific areas of the brain. However, thanks to the work of Dr. Carl Prebrum, Dr. Carl Lashley, Dr. Paul Peach, and others, we now know this is not the case. Dr. Carl Lashley and other scientists have trained rats to navigate mazes, then removed their brains piece by piece, attempting to find where engrams, individual memories, exist. Strangely, however, in the experiments, the rats always remember the training, no matter which piece or how much of the brain is removed. Michael Talbot wrote, Even after removing as much as 90% of a rat's visual cortex, the part of the brain that receives and interprets what the eye sees, he found it could still perform tasks requiring complex visual skills. Similarly, research conducted by Prebrum revealed that as much as 98% of a cat's optic nerves can be severed without seriously impairing its ability to perform complex visual tasks. Such a situation was tantamount to believing that a movie audience could still enjoy a motion picture after 90% of the movie screen was missing, and his experiments presented once again a serious challenge to the standard understanding of how vision works. The orthodox explanation of vision is that the eye sees by taking a photographic image and reproducing it onto the cortical surface of the brain where we interpret it like an internal movie screen. Dr. Lashley's experiment showed, however, that even when 90 to 98 percent of that internal projector screen is missing, the brain still receives and registers the whole movie. Greg Braden wrote, Experiments demonstrated that animals retained memories and continued their lives even though the parts of their brains that were believed to hold these functions were removed. In other words, 
it appeared that there wasn't a direct correspondence between the memories and a physical place in the brain. It was obvious that the mechanical view of brains and memory wasn't the answer. Something else, strange and wonderful, must be happening. These and other experiments have shown that Dr. Lashley's n-gram theory of individual memories existing in certain areas of the brain is provably incorrect. Memories and images are distributed all throughout the brain, just like a picture is stored all throughout a piece of holographic film. Michael Talbot wrote, Paul Pietsch began as an ardent disbeliever in Prebrum's theory. He was especially skeptical of Prebrum's claim that memories do not possess any specific location in the brain. To prove Prebrum wrong, Pietsch devised a series of experiments. Pietsch reasoned that if a salamander's feeding behavior is not confined to any specific location in the brain, then it should not matter how its brain is positioned in its head. If it did matter, Prebrum's theory would be disproven. He then flip-flopped the left and right hemispheres of a salamander's brain. But to his dismay, as soon as it recovered, the salamander quickly resumed normal feeding. He took another salamander and turned its brain upside down. When it recovered, it too fed normally. Growing increasingly frustrated, he decided to resort to more drastic measures. In a series of over 700 operations, he sliced, flipped, shuffled, subtracted, and even minced the brains of his hapless subjects, but always when he replaced what was left of their brains, their behavior returned to normal. These findings and others turned Pietsch into a believer. Salamanders were good subjects for this experiment because they simply go comatose when their brains are removed and then quickly regain normal functioning once it's replaced. In Dr. Pietsch's 700 trials, he subtracted sliced, diced, mashed, and even sausage-ground salamander brains, but no matter what, after putting back whatever was left of their brains, they always regained normal functioning. David Icke wrote, Mainstream science has been unable to locate the area of the brain that contains all the memory, because what we call memory exists throughout the brain and body. This must be the case, because it's a hologram. People with tumors, who have large parts of their brains removed, do not lose specific memories. They might not remember, in general, quite as well, because they have moved to a smaller level of the holographic memory where there is less clarity than in the whole. But they don't lose one memory completely and retain another in crystal clarity as they would if memory was located in one area. The body hologram stores information from all the senses, and so when we smell something, it can trigger a memory just as powerfully as sight or hearing. Even this is another level of the illusion, because if the brain is a hologram, it must also be illusory. It is, like everything in this reality, the physical expression of a frequency field or resonance. Incidentally, the holographic nature of the body means the whole brain and body is involved in decoding the five senses, and not just the visual cortex and other areas of the brain associated with these specific duties. So you can obliterate a salamander's brain in any number of ways, and it will still have a normal life as long as you put a tiny piece of brain back in its head. You can teach a rat to run a maze, then remove any part of its brain, and it will still remember the run. You can remove 90% of a rat's visual cortex, and it will still perform complex visual tasks. You can sever 98% of a cat's optic nerves, and it will still see normally. These, along with many other experiments, strongly suggest that the brain processes images and stores information holographically, all parts in the whole, and the whole in all parts. Because the brain, like a hologram, no matter how small the piece, can still reconstruct the whole. Michael Talbot wrote, Our brains mathematically construct objective reality by interpreting frequencies that are ultimately projections from another dimension, a deeper order of existence that is beyond both space and time. The brain is a hologram enfolded in a holographic universe. What is out there is a vast ocean of waves and frequencies, and reality looks concrete to us only because our brains are able to take this holographic blur and convert it into the sticks and stones and other familiar objects that make up our world. In Michael Talbot's The Holographic Universe, 
He suggests our experience of the smoothness of fine china or the feel of beach sand beneath our feet is like an elaborate version of the so-called phantom limb syndrome, when amputees can still feel their missing limbs long after having been removed. In other words, there are two realities, like Bohm's implicate and explicate orders. In the implicate order, a china cup is just an energetic interference pattern vibrating at a certain frequency. But in the explicate order, after being filtered through the lens of our brains, eyes, and nervous systems, those interference patterns manifest to us as the look and feel of fine china. When asked, so which is real and which is an illusion, Dr. Prebrum replied that both are real to me, or if you want to say, neither of them are real. Lynn McTaggart wrote, Although the metaphor of the hologram was important to Prebrum, the real significance of his discovery was not holography, per se, which conjures up a mental image of the three-dimensional ghostly projection, or a universe which is only our projection of it. It was the unique ability of quantum waves to store vast quantities of information in a totality and in three dimensions, and for our brains to be able to read this information, and from this to create the world. Here was finally a mechanical device that seemed to replicate the way that the brain actually worked, how images were formed, how they were stored, and how they could be recalled or associated with something else. Most important, it gave a clue to the biggest mystery of all for Prebrum, how you could have localized tasks in the brain, but process or store them throughout the larger whole. In a sense, holography is just convenient shorthand for wave interference, the language of the field. Itzhak Bentov said, So here we are, all part of this great hologram called creation, which is everybody else's self. It's all a cosmic play, and there is nothing but you. In the 18th century, a Frenchman named Jean Fourier discovered a mathematical method of converting patterns into simple waveforms called the Fourier transform, a process which later led to the discoveries of both television and holography. When a video camera captures scenes on film, it converts pictures into electromagnetic frequencies, which are then converted back again by your television set. Scientists are now finding that this Fourier transform process is how the brain works as an electromagnetic frequency decoder. We have long known that through our 120 billion miles of DNA and RNA, our entire bodies are involved in a frequency decoding process. We know our ears are audio frequency decoders. Nobel Prize winner George von Beckesy has proven that our skin responds to frequencies, and thanks to neurophysiologists Russell and Karen de Valois, we now know that brain cells in the visual cortex react and activate based on frequency patterns. Lynn McTaggart wrote, University of California at Berkeley, neurophysiologists Russell and Karen de Valois converted simple plaid and checkerboard patterns into Fourier waves and discovered that the brain cells of cats and monkeys responded not to the patterns themselves, but to the interference patterns of their component waves. Countless studies, elaborated on by the de Valois team in their book Spatial Vision, show that numerous cells in the visual system are tuned into certain frequencies. Other studies have showed that the human cerebral cortex may be tuned to specific frequencies. Prebrum conjectured that these wave collisions must create the pictorial images in our brain. When we perceive something, it's not due to the activity of neurons themselves, but to certain patches of dendrites distributed around the brain, which, like a radio station, are set to resonate only at certain frequencies. It is like having a vast number of piano strings all over your head, only some of which would vibrate as a particular note is played. Dr. Prebrum has conjectured that wave interference patterns are likely not created or received by any particular brain cells, but in the spaces between them. Dendrites, the tiny nerve endings of neurons where synapses are fired, communicate with other neurons by sending and receiving electrical and chemical wave impulses. It is plausible that this is where wave frequencies are received and transformed into holographic images, because there are constantly millions of wave interference patterns crisscrossing here anyway. Lynn McTaggart wrote, 
The fact that movement could somehow be represented formally in terms of Fourier equations made Prebrum realize that the brain's conversations with the body might also be occurring in the form of waves and patterns rather than as images. The brain somehow had the capacity to analyze movement, break it down into wave frequencies, and transmit this wave pattern shorthand to the rest of the body. This information, transmitted non-locally to many parts at once, would explain how we can fairly easily manage complicated global tasks involving multiple body parts, such as riding a bicycle or roller skating. It also accounts for how we can easily imitate some task. Freebrum also came across evidence that our other senses, smell, taste, and hearing, operate by analyzing frequencies. In Prebrum's own studies with cats, in which he recorded frequencies from the motor cortex of cats while their right forepaw was being moved up and down, he discovered that, like the visual cortex, individual cells in the cat's motor cortex responded to only a limited number of frequencies of movement, just as individual strings on a piano respond to a limited range of frequencies. The color red in our explicate experience is really just an implicate wave interference pattern vibrating at a frequency of 400 terahertz. The color violet, in our experience, is really just a wave interference pattern vibrating at a frequency of 790 terahertz. Above the spectrum visible to humans are ultraviolet rays, x-rays, and gamma rays. Below the spectrum visible to us are infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. Our brains decode this small sliver of electromagnetic frequencies and create the perceptions and sensations we experience in our consciousness. Using the piano analogy, think of the color red as a low note and the color violet as a high note. A rainbow is a major chord, and a lakeside sunset is a concerto. Lynn McTaggart wrote, Our brain is not a storage medium, but a receiving mechanism in every sense and memory is simply a distant cousin of ordinary perception. The brain retrieves old information the same way it processes new information, through holographic transformation of wave interference patterns. Lashley's rats with the fried brains were able to conjure up their run in its entirety because the memory of it was never burned away in the first place. Whatever reception mechanism was left in the brain, and as Prebrum had demonstrated, it was distributed all over the brain, was tuning back into the memory through the field. Some scientists went as far to suggest that all of our higher cognitive processes result from an interaction with the zero-point field. This kind of constant interaction might account for intuition or creativity, and how ideas come to us in bursts of insight, sometimes in fragments, but often as a miraculous whole. An intuitive leap might simply be a sudden coalescence of coherence in the field. If you take a piece of regular film and cut it up, your image is destroyed forever. However, when you cut up a piece of holographic film, the image is never destroyed. A smaller scale version of the image always exists. If memories were stored locally like regular film, and you cut out that part of the brain, the memory would be lost. But in reality, like holographic film, when you cut out parts of the brain, a smaller scale version of the memory always exists. So just as a piece of holographic film stores complete images as interference patterns throughout its entirety, the human brain stores complete memories as interference patterns throughout its entirety. And just like a laser light focused on a piece of holographic film creates a seemingly physical three-dimensional image, the light of our consciousness Focusing on quanta creates a seemingly physical three-dimensional world. Stanislav Grof wrote, The holographic model offers revolutionary possibilities for a new understanding of the relationships between the parts and the whole. No longer confined to the limited logic of traditional thought, the part ceases to be just a fragment of the whole, but, under certain circumstances, reflects and contains the whole. As individual human beings, we are not isolated and in insignificant Newtonian entities. Rather, as integral fields of the hollow movement, each of us is also a microcosm that reflects and contains the macrocosm. If this is true, then we each hold the potential for having direct and immediate experiential access to virtually every aspect of the universe, 
extending our capacities well beyond the reach of our senses. Another markedly holographic processor present in our bodies and the universe is DNA. Watch any movie or TV series about crime scene investigation and notice that the identity of the culprit can be determined from tiny traces of their DNA. A drop of blood, a fingernail, or a single strand of hair is enough to positively identify the perpetrator. The reason for this is that DNA, like our brains, holographically mirrors each part in the whole and the whole in each part. David Icke wrote, DNA, like RNA, emits light energy in the form of photons to such an extent that it has been compared by some to an ultra-weak laser. They generate coherent light in the same way that our technological lasers do, the lasers that create holograms. The universe broadcasts its signals in wave or interference patterns, and it may be that the laser light emitted by the DNA and RNA is part of the process of turning them into holographic representations of that waveform. One mystery of quantum physics is how particles can either express themselves as a waveform, non-physical, or as a particle, apparently physical, and the waveforms only become particles when they are being observed, when we are looking at them. What is actually happening is that the DNA, RNA, and brain is causing the waveform or interference pattern to project an illusory hologram. The act of observation, focus, projects the hologram from the waveform, and when this happens, the quantum physicists see the waveform becoming a particle. Both the waveform and the particle exist at the same time, and they don't move from one state to the other. When a laser is shown onto a photographic interference pattern to manifest a hologram, one does not replace the other. Both waveform and hologram coexist. It is just that the observer sees the hologram as the prime reality. The waveform is possibility. The particle is physical experience. Ever-increasing evidence overwhelmingly suggests that our brains, bodies, DNA, and the entire universe are non-local, holographic transducers incessantly interacting with a deeper quantum reality. This hollow movement is an undivided wholeness in flowing motion, where all perceived separation is ultimately illusory like whirlpools in a river. Even the seeming separation of forms and consciousness into relatively independent subtotalities only exists at the explicate level. As David Bohm put it simply, deep down, the consciousness of mankind is one. David Icke wrote, Scientists can't understand why subatomic particles can communicate instantly with each other over staggering distances, because they are thinking in terms of space but there is no space involved. It is like the droplet of water in the ocean. There are no particles, plural, except in the way we perceive them in the illusion. All particles are the same one. They don't have to communicate between each other because there is no each other, and they don't move from one place to another because there is no space, and so can be no places. Appropriately, the word utopia means no place beyond the illusion of time and space. The super-hologram appears to occupy space, and we talk of the vastness of space, but it's a hologram, and so that cannot be. If there is no space, how come we seem to travel through it? Once again, because that is the illusion our DNA and RNA decodes for us, and we travel through space only as electrical signals interpreted by the brain. Jake Horsley wrote, Every particle in the universe is a carrier of knowledge. In other words, in some form or another, every particle can be said to be conscious. As humatons, we tend to assume that only we are conscious, because only we seem to be self-conscious. Not only that, we have attributed our consciousness to a single organ only, the brain. And it is possible we only use 10% of that organ with which to deduce all of this. It would seem to be equally possible, however, and a lot more logical, to assume that the brain is merely a receiver of information, a tuning dial that picks up data and translates it into sense impressions and rational thought, images, and so forth, and that knowledge as such, memory, is stored in every single atom of our bodies. For organic beings, 
the filing system provided for every living molecule is DNA. As such, if we were to tune in with the remaining 90% of our brains, we would be capable of receiving vastly greater amounts of data than we are presently accustomed to. Just as knowledge, memory, and experience is passed through generations of a given species, presumably via DNA, in order for the species to evolve as a whole, so information would appear to be shared freely amongst all the billions upon billions of particles that make up the physical universe. This is cooperation on a grand scale. Every particle is conscious. Every particle is potentially conscious of what every other particle is conscious of. And all particles are connected together into a single tapestry of consciousness, information, and energy which is, it therefore follows, conscious of what every particle is conscious of, and conscious of itself as a unified whole, a living, conscious organism. Ergo, the universe is a super-conscious being within which all beings exist and have life and consciousness. It is God, and every one of its parts and components, as in a hologram, in which each fragment contains the whole, is also God, the totality in and of itself.